Hello and welcome. It is We Made It, uh, episode 50 of the Startup Business Q&A. Uh, <laughs> week number 50. I even wrote it on the board, look. So I'm quite pleased with this uh, and everyone who has been supporting all along, thank you very much. It is Monday, 1pm GMT and uh, it's one of my favourite times of the week because we get to do some really great interaction. I tend to find that whilst every day is involving people uh, in different businesses around the world who have very kindly said, you know, Richard, can you help me out? At the same time, it's bloody brilliant to be able to interact with you guys. And every week, being able to answer questions that people send my way is absolutely fantastic, so I'm really pleased. So I wrote, <laughs> this is all in mirror, by the way, I don't know if you know, if you ever do a Facebook Live, everything's back to front, which is why I can't do a whiteboard and write stuff down for you, because it's all inverted, so I'm gonna have to change the camera soon. Um, but uh, I'm going to write that backwards. Thank you so much, everyone who's giving me all the love right now. It's an amazing feeling to have done this many. Uh, it's almost been a year and uh, it's been fantastic. I feel it's about an average of 800, sorry, about 400 questions. So uh, all of you who have uh, sent questions through, all of you supported it. Every time, every single week that I do this, there are hundreds of views of these as well. So I'm really proud that so many people will like, like it. Um, just before I get into the questions, I do want to say um, it's been quite a week uh, or the last couple of days, the weekend was a pretty rough one uh, in terms of the terrorist attacks in London and uh, it would be remiss of me to not mention them. So my thoughts go out to everyone who's been affected by it. It's certainly created a very sombre mood here in, 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 well, near London and all up and down the country. There was an amazing concert up in Manchester yesterday and that's kind of bolstered everyone's mood somewhat but I had so many kind words from a lot of you uh, uh, asking how things are and if our fan, friends and family are alright and, and indeed they are um, uh, but I but I uh, might just want to say and dedicate uh, a lot of um, what I do to uh, friends and family and it's moments like this then they really mean a lot to me so um, thanks so much everyone who sent that through and uh, yeah let's move on um, with the with the session so episode 50 and uh, I've got a few questions here. I want you to put comments uh, in here if you have a question right now that you want to have featured on the 50th uh, show, then of course, then put them in right now and we'll answer them uh, as we go through. But let's start. We have Lewis Clack who wrote the first question, which is, what, is the, what does the future hold for Richard Moore's startup career? Um, so that was a weird first question, but one that was quite apt. Um, interestingly, I would say, I don't think any of my businesses are actually startups anymore, the ones that I personally have built, um, because they've been around for a while, but more specifically, they've kind of moved through the initial growing pains of being startups and moved on to now being like, you know, uh, well, basically being companies that are running in their own what, what rights, they wipe their own faces, they have their own profit, and they don't have to, they're not in that kind of very much the startup phase. But in terms of start my startup career, I suppose, um, there was a beginning point when I was starting lots of businesses. I now very much start businesses with others. So those of you out here uh, who are listening, who know uh, we've worked together, many people and I who have a startup business. And I, what I really enjoy uh, more than anything is helping people through that initial stage when they're building something. Uh, there's a recent client that we started working with him about a week ago, and we're going to leverage one of his personal hobbies that he's had for 20 years he never thought it was possible we're going to turn that into something that can become his life and to be able to do that with someone is an amazing journey and I, that's really what i enjoy doing so the, i don't know what the future holds to be honest lewis because there's a lot of different things that may happen certainly there's a lot of opportunities coming and i i will tell you now the more you put into these things uh, the more consistent you are the more you don't stop the more things come in your direction so there's a lot of great stuff happening at the moment and I'm really excited by that but thanks so much a really good starting question um, another question here that's come through uh, which is uh, what would you say has been your most profitable investment recently so it's quite an interesting one uh, I've actually worked with uh, a number of types of investment um, so for instance I invest in startup businesses often the ones that I actually am, am uh, guiding and mentoring when I you know if I really connect with that person running it but also if I really see that there's something exciting about it and, and it's a it's one of those what's called a hell yes moment then I tend to find that that's a really good opportunity to uh, you know to actually in, in invest in them I also invest in other things so I invest in, in shares and stuff and things like that but I also um, invest in people so for instance um, 
uh, a while back I invested in a trader. I gave him a fund and I said, you're the trader. I certainly am not when it comes to Forex. And this guy who's amazing what he does over in New York. He had a fund from me. And at the end of the, uh, I think it was every month we reviewed it. And every month he gave me uh, a particular uh, profit on it. So it was a really exciting thing to do. He needed capital and I wanted to get the result of great Forex trading. And uh, I certainly had other things to do rather than go learn a whole new industry. So that was a very good in this, uh, investment for me I think one of the it's really hard to say because there's lots of them to be honest but one of the I don't know what recently means whoever asked this question actually it could be several years back uh, um, the properties that I bought uh, were worth a lot more but I think one of the most recent ones uh, was a business I'd invested in um, it's you know this is to try this into a real point here there was a uh, a guy that I uh, met simply through networking and this is just the, the point here of the value of networking you never know who it is you might come across this guy ended up he and I connected really well we have personal interests uh, in martial arts and things like that he ended up becoming a managing director of a very big company here in the UK which is part of a larger group that is listed on the stock exchange and he's a um, you know a really good uh, solid example of someone who ex knows what he's doing and so he was saying you know here's it we're, we're we're a business that's doing he was telling me about how great the business is and what it's done and I just thought as this guy is the managing director of the helm he sounds like he knows what he, really what he's doing and I did loads of digging and looking at, at what his business did and I invested a load into it um, and the results being fantastic I mean serious percentage uh, increase in, in return for me. But that's only because I've really done my research, but also it's because I, I wouldn't have got to know this guy in the first place unless I'd been out there every day, always meeting new people. So unless it's something you already do, I strongly suggest, uh, this is an interesting direction this question's taken us, this answer's taken us, but I strongly suggest you make a point of in, investing time meeting new people every day. And in fact, one of the things I often tell a lot of my clients to do who are perhaps in a bit of an insular space or who need a bit of inspiration is suggest in fact that at least once a week they go and have a conversation or coffee or a cup of tea you know go go for a meal uh, even just have a Skype call with someone new who's influential who's higher up than you are it puts you out of the comfort zone just because you're speaking to someone new but also you get to learn new things from people so it's a really good idea to go out and meet something you know someone new who's got a new idea and it could be someone in your space it could be someone who does something similar to, to um, what you do. It could be someone who's doing something you'd like to do in the future. But it's not necessarily about getting hold of people who do what you do so much as getting hold of people who are successful and looking at where the common traits are across them because then you can of course you know leverage that too it's a really interesting thing to do it's certainly very inspiring when you meet people who are really good at what they're at at what they're all about so uh, that's my suggestion there uh, next question here is is lighting important for videos can you tell me what you use to get better quality for your videos yeah lighting's important i mean i'm, I'm not like a world-class photographer or anything like that one thing i do know is that there are two things that really stand out when it comes to video and this is on the basis that it's a given your content's good it should be a given that your content's outstanding whatever it is you have to say or, or you know what you're producing but i do think in terms of the video quality lighting is probably you know about as important as it gets next to resolution so make sure your camera's on a set set onto a highest re resolution get decent lighting the, the lighting i use is actually you can get from uh from amazon you could get you could spend like 60 dollars you can get softbox lighting and uh you know the tripods with the with the big lights and the kind of the umbrella things they're really worth getting because then it gives you a more flattering look and it makes it look like you're in daytime and you can record uh you know with decent quality view uh, lighting even if it's the middle of the night for instance but the other thing so lighting is key yeah but i, I want to take this point to say without question weirdly the thing that makes your video look amateurish or not is actually the sound seriously you could have a really you must have seen this before if you look on youtube enough if you know there are amazingly well produced video okay but the sounds crap you know you've got like the wind blowing or something like that or it's a bit muffled you can't hear properly and I remember, I remember years ago when I first started shooting videos in my car because I was like, I don't have time to do this. I have so many meetings. I just shoot videos as I go. And before I got a microphone, this lapel microphone, um, I found that 
I could be heard, but there was this drone of the engine all the time in the background. It just seemed budget. The moment I got a decent microphone, the change was outrageous. And so more important, this is the, what professionals tend to tell me, more important than the video quality, okay, and the lighting is in fact the audio, okay? So, you know, this microphone's a really solid one and it means that it picks up the bass in my voice, it means it's uh, not picking up anything else around me and you get the best of my voice and so it sounds clear and crisp and it's production level, so I've done audio books and things with, with, good, mon with uh, good microphones as well. Um, you've got to invest in one, that, you know, there's, here's one that I've used for uh, recording audio books as well, if I can pull it apart. Uh, and it's worth doing because, I mean, this was, this thing cost quite a bit. Uh, it's got this big kind of thing on top of it, but it cost me, I think, a few hundred dollars. But it was worth getting because then you get some really high quality sound when you're recording, uh, as I say, recording audiobooks and things like that. So it's worth getting audio right. But yeah, lighting, get some soft box lighting. It's worth doing. It doesn't have to cost, cost much. Suddenly it looks a lot more professional as well. And you get, you know, that quality lighting coming in. All my courses are shot. Uh, certainly Basics of Sales course was shot with decent lighting and it made such a difference to it, it really illuminated where it should. But I, I, I'm not really a pro in that kind of space, but it's good enough. You'll tend to find, if you're trying to bang out some video, your camera on your phone is probably good enough really, as long as you're not doing it in a dingy place. And the, one of the big things about lighting is don't do it with a window behind. If you're, on the in, if you're indoors, don't shoot video with a, with a window behind you, because this huge brightness will be the powerful thing and your face then won't be lit you'll be, have this dark face look ridiculous so anyway you find that out stick it on youtube you've got plenty of results there for how to do decent lighting on on videos um any uh, more questions uh, anyone who's joining in there's loads of people piling into this thank you so much for joining this is episode 50 right there uh 50 of the startup business q a i'm absolutely pumped today i've got such an, a massive week ahead uh with so many great opportunities that i've just closed on another uh one piece of work with a PR agency who reached out to me uh, who are working with a big transportation uh, business I'm not allowed to mention them uh, here in the UK and they had seen uh, one of the articles last year by a business called 99 designs who uh, are they had listed me as like I think it was one of the top 14 influencers in London uh, on social media uh, which is really a kind thing to do and these kind of things have brought up so many opportunities and and it's a testament to um, focusing on being consistent, which is my big thing every week, making sure you're always showing up. It's interesting that you get a lot of people who come up with great ideas and they come up with great uh, content. And then when you check them out two months later on a Tuesday afternoon, they're nowhere to be seen, you know. And the key and the thing I really know is that even if my content isn't that great necessarily, even if people don't necessarily like me that much, the reality is that year after year, literally every day, I'm producing content um, for the audience I have. And, you know, there are the jabs, there's the right hooks, and the result is wonderful opportunities, bigger and better opportunities all the time. And 50 is, I, I can't wait till I have 100, 150 and so on as well, but I know I'll do it. So you check in uh, in a year from now, but four weeks, you'll find I'll be here doing episode 100. And it, there's been weddings, there's been, I've posted about this recently, weddings, birthdays, wedding anniversaries, Christmas Day, New Year's, whatever. I'm always showing up with the same kind of, love it, I love it when it cuts out, but why not? <laughs> so uh, yeah, there we are. I was just going to say, you know, it, it, it's all about making sure that there's that consistency there. So uh, I know that year in, year out, I'll be here providing content every day, and 50 is an example of what happens when you keep going, and um, I'm really proud of it. So thank you very much. It's all because of you guys. If no one ever turned up, if no one ever asked questions, I wouldn't be doing it. There's no point. But it has stood the test of time. I'm really pr proud of it. Uh, I don't know what happened there. A bit of a technical glitch. But let's move on to the next question. So um, that was a good one with the lighting. I hope that helps. If you have any questions, if you have any questions for the Startup Business Q&A today, put them in the comments and I'll... I'll answer them. Uh, next question here from Danny Patrick. Richard, how do you manage to stay on track with your startup while working a nine to five job? This is a very important question. 
Very important question. Adam, I think you were writing a question there, so go ahead and do it again if I missed it in the last one, because the comments will obviously be reset with it being a new, uh, a new broadcast. So, um, yeah, how do you manage to stay on track? This is so important. The ideal, okay, is if you must do a nine to five or a job and you want to do your, your, uh, your startup, what you ideally want to do is give your startup the best hours of the day. If I had, um, you know, you guys tune in because you want my, one man's opinion, my opinion, okay? If I had to go to work because I was starting a new startup and I hadn't got the capital to keep a roof and cars and, and uh, the family surviving and I had to go and get a job, my best hours of the day are hours like now, when it's the middle of the day, my body is nice and fresh, it's working hard, compared with in the middle of the night. If I'm focused on building a startup and the startup means the most to me and I want that to be my thing, the best hours of my day should be given to my startup, okay? If the nine to five, inverted commas, and I'll come to when it is exactly in a sec, if the nine to five is purely there for financial support while I build my startup, why would I want it to be nine to five? Let's look at this. If you're gonna work nine to five, and you're going to finish the day at five, get home, have tea, put your children to bed or whatever, and then start work from eight till two in the morning, why would you work those seven or eight hours on your startup when you're shattered, instead of doing, and do your best hours for the business that's just giving you income? You should switch them. And I, I honestly, if I was doing this again, if I had to work to provide myself with income purely in a nine to five, I would shift that. I would get a night job. I would be doing a nine to five that started at seven and finished uh, at six or something and finished at two in the morning. That's what I would be doing. And I would be getting up at eight after getting, you know, getting home at finishing at two, getting getting into bed getting up at eight or nine in the morning and working my nuts off through the day on my startup. The best hours of the day, when my possible uh, potential customers are out there as well, that's the time to be working on the business. So I'm gonna answer this question in a sec, but this is really important. This is how I'd do it. Why don't most people do it? Oh, because I don't know if people would let me do that, or I don't know if there are jobs out there like that. Nonsense, of course there are. There are plenty of jobs that require people to be working from you know six till two, two in the morning. Go work in a 24 hour supermarket. Seriously, this is so important. You shouldn't be giving your best hours to something which is purely there as a vehicle to give you financial um, you know, su support while you're building your startup. Right down the down the road, there's a supermarket. If I had to work in a supermarket nine to five, it would be ridiculous if I was working on my startup to then come home, be knackered, and work on my business that needs all of my attention and creativity. Flip it over. It's a 24-hour uh, um, supermarket. I would be working there late. Okay, same number of that hours in a week, but working it late because if I'm going to be tired. On, on, on a business, I'd rather do it on someone else's, uh, um, uh, someone else's business than on my own, okay? Now, to answer this question directly, how do you manage to stay on track with your startup? It's not about the tasks you're doing, Danny. It's about focusing on the outcome you're after. How do you stay on track? Because you should want it. If you don't want your, st I can't remember what her, her business was, actually. She's, she's done something that's very much focused on a passion she has, but uh, if you have a focus, on building a business because it centers or orbits around a passion you've got, something you're really into. Why the hell would you not be focused on that outcome? I, you know, there's a guy I spoke to recently who's really into video games and he said it sucks because I wish I could incorporate video games more into my life. I feel I shouldn't because that's, that's just not cool. And I said, rubbish, there's a client I have who've worked with me for some time who, and I've mentioned this guy before, he's taken video gaming interest and turned into his business. He runs tournaments every week, uh, sorry, every month uh, across the country in the US and um, 
He has loads of people attend them. And as a result, you've got these uh, amazing things being run. Everyone's coming together. There's this great community. There's prizes and everything. There's loads of people. He's getting sponsorship now. And this is all born out of leveraging his passion and his hobby. He focuses on the outcome. You focus on what is it you want to do. And that's how you get on and do take action when there's something uh, that to be done that you don't really want to do. You've got to do your accounting. I've got to do some accounting stuff today. I have an accountant, but there are some things I always need to check in on. And it's like, I would rather be doing something else because there's a great product I'm working on at the moment. I want to work on that. Sure, of course I do. But I've got this accounting that needs to be done. Why am I doing it? Because it's important. It's, it's part of the, the, the process to getting me the results I'm after ultimately. So you need to focus on the outcome and that should drive you. You should be breathlessly waiting to get to be able to get to that point where you can work on your startup. And a lot of people make a mistake, by the way, of feeling that there's no transition between I have a nine to five and a startup and I have a startup and they wait for that day where they can completely offset having a nine to five job with money from their startup before they go to run just the startup on their own. That's stupidity. There's something in the middle, which is a part time job. If I'm working a nine to five job and I make fifty thousand dollars a year and I need to offset that money to be able to do my uh, startup on its own, then why wouldn't I get a part time job that pays me twenty five thousand dollars a year? And, you know, when I can when I've taken half of the money that I would otherwise get from that job uh, to be paid by my startup, think about it. You know, you can transition to be doing your startup. I would be doing less and less work for other people and more and more for my business as it grows rather than waiting to time I can completely offset it. That's an intelligent way uh, of building it. Let's have a look at some of the questions in here. This is episode 50 if you just joined in and I thank you deeply for joining me uh, on the uh, Startup Business Q&A for a 50th week. It's almost a year, right? Two weeks time. I can't wait for that. And um, we've also got, uh, if you've got any questions to pop into the um, uh, into the uh, comments. So Rukan Malas has asked, I'm starting my new startup. What should I be aware of? Nate, a lot of things, right? But I've started many startups and more. I've started... I've worked with people who are starting startups dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. There's so many uh, different experiences that we've had. One of the things you must be aware of is that it's typically going to spend, take more time than you think. And so at least the rule of three is applicable here. However long you think things are going to take, it will take longer still and often about three times as long, because stuff happened. And I was thinking about this a lot of the weekend because um, there's someone I was in touch with who is very, uh, and, and I um, absolutely applaud his ambition. I think he's uh, in his early mid twenties and he's talking about having billionaire status by the time he's 28. I'm really proud of uh, people who have that kind of uh, ambition. Good for you. Um, I'm not going to say talk is cheap, but what I'm keen on is seeing the results from this guy. I'd be really interested to see what happens. If he, get, if he becomes a billionaire by the time he's 28, then well done. I'm really impressed with that. But w one thing I do think is that you've got to... Um, You've got to recognize that building a business on, on your own doesn't really work, especially when you want it to grow and thrive. You need to work with other people. And the thing is, when you move outside of that hermetic situation where it's just you and you rely on yourself and you know what your limitations are, you know what you're good at, you know what strengths and advantages are, when you involve other people, and if it's not just on your team or in your business, it's customers as well, you then are involving humans. And the thing is, you can't plan or legislate, uh, you can't write down on a piece of paper or a flow chart the process and how it's going to look. You know, in seven months from tomorrow, we will be on this much project earnings three months later we'll be on this much projected earnings here's how we'll grow here's how everything's going to work because it's not an electronic circuit board where this equals that and this equals that and this thing runs into that these are people stuff happens you know um it's the same as when I got a great salesperson on my team years ago and I was like, I'm made. I'm going to make so much more money this month. Then he gets ill. Oh, OK, now he's, now he's not here. So I now I need to find out where I'm going to you know, find the difference. Something happens. There's a guy I'm working with at the moment. He's just got divorced and he's just managed to sell his house. And it's like the guy has been... He's been physically in an office for the last month, but he's mentally just not there. He's world class at what he was doing beforehand, but he's just lost it for a bit. And you can't 
plan for that kind of thing. So one thing you've got to understand is when you're starting your business, it takes a load of time. And more often than not, it takes a load of time because of people. And you can have people, when you're on a phone call, when you're selling someone, if you're in the shop with them, you can be doing a great job. They can be nodding and saying, yeah, this is perfect, exactly what it is I want. They walk out the door and then someone else collars them and they spend the money elsewhere. Stuff will happen because of people. So be aware it takes time, okay? So you must be patient. Uh, one thing as well is is that you will, one of the, the greatest things someone ever told me, which is a, a self-made uh, millionaire, multimillionaire, worth about 25 million as a CEO uh, in London, I was an operations consultant for uh, many years ago. And he said, Richard, no one will help you, okay? But no one will stop you. And so that's worth bearing in mind as well. You've got to understand that whilst you can get advice, you can pay for courses, you can get mentors and guides and things like that, but no one's gonna do it for you. You have to go help yourself. So working with that emotion where it can be very lonely at times, you can be very tired, you can find that you are uh, you know, very much feeling like you're on your own in terms of people believing in you, but you have to be aware that those emotions need to be kept in check. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd add here, Rukan, it's such a good question uh, if you're starting a new startup. And by the way, Rukan, I really invite you to send me a PM after this. Let's have a chat and see the kind of business you're working on. Uh, the other thing I, I would say is, you know, your ambition is so important. It's so important to keep that. The optimism okay the belief in yourself at the beginning when you're starting your business it is there when things go wrong it's still there it's just that you shove it to one side typically because you emotionally want to to wallow okay so the best thing to do is ignore that feeling and focus as much as you can on staying optimistic but more specifically staying ambitious and pushing yourself to do stuff okay so Think about that. I mean, there's so many pieces of advice I can offer. So I, I would urge you to get in touch. We can have a chat a bit more about it. But be aware of that. Emotion's going to hit you. And the number one piece of advice I would say, is, uh, I always talk about consistency, but, but really now it is evolving to action. Consistent action. The thing you should be aware of is that it's always tempting to stop, pause, think, start feeling like you're making it. You know, I've seen it before when someone closes a $50,000 deal, now suddenly they're chilling out, now suddenly they're playing golf, now suddenly they're swaggering around like they own the place. No, you don't. You've got one big sale. You need to go and do more of it and you need to bolster the business. Focus on the business like it's one of your children. Give it everything it needs every single day like you do with your children. I've been a father now for closing five years. And before that, I was <laughs> there was a pregnant wife there as well, remember? So I'm pushing almost six years worth of dealing with that kind of thing. And there hasn't been a single day when I haven't had to spin into any of my thoughts. What about my children? What about my children? Are they okay? And literally... What about meals? What about school? What about all this stuff? Every day you have to think about it. And you have to view your business the same. You can't switch off from a startup like that. This is why in many industries, between 50 and 90% of startups fail in the first year. It's because a lot of people will seek the champagne lifestyle. Very few people believe uh, in themselves enough or have the consistency in taking action to actually get themselves where they need to. I strongly urge you to focus on action shut the hell up about how you're doing focus on just delivering results 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 nothing else matters let that do the talking the moment you're doing well and things are starting to, to work out don't just drop a load of cash in your bank account and go off on holiday now it's starting to, to, to be a problem that's the equivalent of saying oh my child fed themselves for the first time today I'm sure they'll do it every other day now I'll leave them to it a bit or I've just potty changed my child I'll let them now deal with imagine that that my, my, my baby just used the potty for the first time I'll let them use it whenever they need the bathroom now now we're in trouble because now I have to clean the carpet every 10 minutes because
because they they are not quite there yet. You need to be there every day and you need to look after it. So I strongly suggest uh, the best way to do that is on constant action rather than sitting back and going, yeah, I think it's working out now. I learned that the hard way a long time ago, not directly by, via working on a startup, but when I was uh, made a manager for the first time, it was like 2004, I think it was. And it was one of those classic situations where it's like, okay, Richard, you just made a lot of money for us. Let's see what it looks like if we stick a load of people around you and make you a manager of them. And I was lit. I did everything but put my feet on the desk and went, I'm the boss now, so you guys go get on with it. And I sat back and expected money to roll in. And it was ridiculous. It didn't work. It was complacency straight away. And I remember when we got a few deals, then I would sit back again. I very quickly learned, probably only after a couple of months. Do you know what? I need to be in the trenches every day. I need to make, make, be making sure that this is working. Even if I feel my team has got it, get in there. Okay, so I hope that, hope that helps. Rook, and that's an amazing amazing question a great one for our 50th show and yeah pm me let's have a chat about what you're working on adam you've written for example if they're doing pay as you go how can you change the scheme to benefit yourself and keep the clients happy uh, i think you're talking so adam mosley is a uh, private trainer uh, so he's like a personal trainer and health consultant uh, based in london i know him well when my clients and by the way if you need any help with uh, health uh, and nutrition Adam Mosley is the guy I go to. So there's a recommendation for you if you're interested in. Uh, and, and I run two taekwondo schools, so I need to be kept fit and healthy. Right. And so he's the guy and I think he's doing consulting calls. It's worth you checking him out. For example, they're doing pay as you go. How can you check? What, where's the rest of your question, Adam? Um, <laughs> so I think you're asking me. I don't, write your question again. Be clear because I don't get what you're asking here. Um, do you uh, do pay, pay as you go? How can you change the scheme to benefit yourself and keep your clients happy? Um, OK, so. Pay as you go. I, mean, I think what, what Adam's saying here is if you have clients who pay every time they turn up. So, for instance, if I was running one of my taekwondo, taekwondo classes and had people here um, uh, turning up and paying on the door, how can I uh, change the scheme to benefit me? Look, that's exactly a great example of, of what happens when you're running a business and you're relying on people to deliver for you. It won't work. So it's in my opinion, a bad way to build a business because you can't project what you're going to make the next month. On the 25th day of every single month of every single year, I know that all of the money from all of the students in all of my schools, well, I have two of schools, um, are going, is going to be paid into the bank account. The reason why is because it's set up automatically with their banks Otherwise, they're not allowed to train with me. So I switched from, uh, well, I never did a pay as you go because I, I, I used to train with an instructor that did it. And of course, then you're waiting for me. Oh, I didn't bring it this month. Can I just pay you at the end of the week? Oh, I forgot. Can I give you, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you double next week because I like that. And you're trying to keep track of all this stuff going on. It's easy to say every month, a month in advance, by the way, I so it so people pay on the 25th of the month for the month to come. So 25th of June, they're going to be paying for July's lessons. And it means if they don't show up, they've already paid, okay? It, and what I do is I say, there's a set number of holidays across the year, but otherwise it's all absorbed and it's a set amount each month. So that across Christmas, when we're off for two weeks, you still pay the same amount that month because it's the extra has been absorbed into other months. So I know what I'm getting paid every single month. I know exactly how much is coming in each month rather than starting a new month. And I've done this before when you say to yourself, right, uh, I'm on zero again. I need to go and get some money. Let's hope people show up. And imagine if you're a personal trainer and you train outside. Imagine instead of Taekwondo, if I did football, okay, or something like that, or baseball if in the States, right? If I'm outside, no one's going to show up. If it's winter, people don't want to show up because they're tired and they're, they're, they want to be in bed because it's warm and they don't want to get wet. So as a result, <laughs> I'm in trouble because I, I know someone who did this. They did a boot camp every Saturday morning and everyone's like, yeah, let's go and get pumped and let's do our boot camp. And it worked really well in January. OK, when they were starting New Year's, New Year's resolutions, it worked really well in August. It was nice and warm and sunny in the mornings. But any other day of the year, they weren't bothering at all because they would rather be in bed. So this woman standing, I remember her saying to me once, this is in December as well. She said to me, Richard, I just stood in a field and no one showed up and I didn't get paid for it. And I remember thinking, and it wasn't a brag, it was just a better payment scheme. I remember thinking, 
I'm going home uh, to, to, to spend Christmas in the next week, uh, you know, with family, I will be getting paid by those customers because of the way I've set this thing up. So it's way more intelligent. How can you go, how can you uh, change the scheme to benefit yourself is what Adam's asked here. I would say change it so people pay monthly. And you know, what you need to do is, you don't just say it's because I prefer it, just say it's just, it, it's because there's so many people, it's very difficult to keep track. It's a little easier if we just do it this way every single month. And, and that way it keeps everyone happy because everyone knows what's going out as well. People don't wanna be dragging cash with them every time. It's a lot easier just to pay out every single month. And if people say no, this is the crucial thing, and this is the same for any business. If customers say no to your terms, well, unless you're willing to make, maybe if you've got three clients, if you're willing to make an exception, then you find someone else to work with. And in all the time I've run the Taekwondo schools, there's been a couple of people who have pr a problem with the amount of money. Because I'm the most expensive Taekwondo school in the whole area, I charge a lot more. And they've got a problem with it. No problem, you need to go find another school then, okay? Or I think there's one person once who, had a, who wanted to pay month, pay weekly. Sorry, that's not how we do it, okay? That's just not how we do it. But, I, but then I would be able to come then okay sorry that's not how we do it it's not fair on other people and you just got to stick fast with some of these things because then everyone's on the same page and for everyone who for every person who won't do it your way there'll be 20 who are fine with it so you just got to go seek out them instead uh, adam i hope that helps let's see what other questions have come up uh, everyone who's joining in thank you so much this is the 50th episode and everyone being here means so much to me thank you love that richard uh rukan thanks so much Jackie Levine, results and action. Absolutely, Jackie, that's worked well. And I, I, I hope your, um, uh, your business, in the uh, holistic help uh, or health uh, box thing you're making is going well. Uh, let me see what else we've got. Noble Nat, how to get started in sales. I had this question, I think it was uh, last week actually in the sales Q&A on the Thursday. How to get started in sales? Really simple, you need to sell stuff. My personal view is it's better, it's a flippant answer I know, but the best way to go sell something is to be, on a, be in a system where you don't get much in the way of basic. So if you want to go and sell for someone else, which is what I first did when I left university, I got a sales job in the city and I was selling internet marketing at the turn of the century. So the story goes, I was speaking to a lot of people who, uh, they had a website, but it was like, they didn't believe people were going to buy from them. They just had it like you have a business card because you think you should. And, um, but I got, I did well in that sales job because I had a tiny basic. Uh, I had, I think it was a 15,000 pound basic, which actually in London I could barely survive on. And I, I made it worse because I deliberately lived in a flat I couldn't afford. So I had to make commission. Um, the best way to do it, to really learn sales, is, well, there's two things I would say. Firstly, do a sale of a product where you don't have a basic wage, where you have to make commission. Because if, as long as the commission scheme's decent, you won't survive unless you make sales. So it creates that need, okay? And you have to have that hunger. I was in a position then where if I didn't make any money, I was in deep trouble because I couldn't afford to actually put food in my mouth. I had to have suits, I had to turn up for client meetings, I had to have new shirts, I had to run a house basically. All that kind of stuff had to be relying on money. And then of course it's, it was the same when I moved to becoming a consultant and stopped working for other people years ago. I had, a, I had a mortgage, I had property, I had cars, I had a wife then, then she got a baby, of course, then we, we moved to a place where she wasn't working. So all that required me again to have the hunger and the need to deliver sales okay so that's a great way of getting started create a situation where you have to sell too many businesses i i work with one actually too many businesses pay their sales staff too much of a basic wage and people say it's oh it's a great gesture it's a perk you shouldn't need to pay them more commission give them a higher percentage commission make them inspired by the amount of money they could level up with by having a great commission package rather than them 
that basic because those who aren't that hungry who aren't born to do it you know what they do they they condition themselves themselves to be okay with living on their basic and it's a huge error and it's not fair on them because what you're doing is you're creating a situation where you're lowering the need to push themselves to be the best they are and they as a result it's doing them a disservice i think because they won't focus on their potential, on realising their best potential because they're already making a load of money. There are people out there who will be fine with not earning that much commission because they've got this beautiful basic. So that's a good thing to, th to say. The other thing as well is I strongly believe you should be, you know, a, to, a great way of learning sales is to invest in yourself within the first six months. Remember, I, I was just a kid. I'd just left university. Um, rather than seeing it as a nine to five, I started investing in myself. So very early on, the first book I ever bought on sales was a book called um, Why People Don't Buy Things. And I bought it within the first six months. I, and people were like, you've taken your money and bought a book on work. What the hell's wrong with you? Haven't you finished school yet? Why do you want to learn more? And I was like, but hang on, if I can learn more, I'll be better on the phone and I'll be able to sell more. And then within a year, I remember I'd spent 500 quid, which at the time was a huge amount of money for me. I spent 500 pounds, or like $700 it would be, um, on a conference at, the, at that one of the weekends, I remember. So my mates were like, well, we were going to go and play football or go to the pub or something. I'm like, this weekend is blocked off for work. And they're like, what's up with you, man? <laughs> Why, why are you going? I was at the Excel uh, Arena, which is near London City Airport, and it was how to, it was negotiating and sales. And I learned so much, and that 500 quid I made back so much faster. Plus, I was pumped and I was inspired. And I learned from other people. Getting started in sales, you've got to get on the ground and do it. You must get in the trenches and you've got to sell every day a decent amount of time. Ideally, build your own business doing it because then you can get, you can really enjoy it. But experience is a wonderful thing. And so you can cash in on being intense. So every day you spend a lot of time uh, on the front line and also investing in yourself. I strongly suggest you get courses, uh, books and so on. Don't think that that's going to offset hard work. You've got to get out there and do it. But I do strongly believe that's worth doing it I leveled up like you'd never believe and I was rocketing up the leaderboard on in that company because I'd spent so much time on me myself and a lot of money on myself as well outside of the nine to five okay so I really suggest that if you want to get started in sales go sell something it won't be long before I'm rolling out um a sales uh, associate scheme for my basics of sales course. By the way, if you want to learn basics of sales, I've condensed all my sales experience of 15 odd years uh, into a course, basics of sales. Go to eightstepstartup.com and you can see the basics of sales course right there. Six sessions and the results are fantastic. I've had people come back to me saying, um, I sold a car this week by using your techniques. I had a guy the other day who was speaking to who said, using your course, I got myself a pay rise. So many wonderful things people have done. So um, go out there and use it. But I do think, uh, you know, you, you should be investing in yourself as well. Great question, Noble. Thanks very much for sharing that. Uh, everyone else, again, I'm just scrolling through here. So many people jumping in. Capital Sony, what do you think about drop shipping? Well, it's a very intelligent thing to do uh, if you are trying to automate a process. Uh, and I think that it's working for a lot of people as well. Uh, go read the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss and you'll see and under you can understand how to automate something. And look, at the end of the day, if you're running a if you're going to run the kind of business where you're trying to minimize overheads and you have product and it's going to be in an inventory, there's an inventory somewhere across the world that you want to pass on uh, uh, to, to potential customers. Well, then drop shipping maybe makes a bit more sense for you. I think ultimately, there's, I think ultimately, if you really want to grow, you need to get past that. It's a great start point. A lot of people are really good at making a lot of good money off it. But personally, it, it sits alongside this idea of affiliate marketing, which is all, no, all very great. But I don't feel it's particularly noble a business. For some people, they just care about making the money. So no problem at all. And to be honest, if I was 20, like, in 2017 with the internet in front of me i'd probably try out affiliate marketing or drop shipping or something like that because it's a quick way to make some quick money but you know i'm not pushing 37 now and i'm in a point where 
I really want to create what well, I have had for years, wanted, wanted to have a legacy. So an actual real business that does something based on something I create and value. So my main business is consulting with businesses, going to them. I'm starting with another one in a couple of weeks time where I'm going to their company offices. I'm sitting down with all the exec team and we're building a training program from the ground up. Uh, and I can't wait to get in there and running something like that or consulting with a company on an operations level, going to real bricks and mortar companies, maybe they're an internet company, maybe they're a, you know, bricks and mortar is in, there's an actual office, not some some chap in their bedroom, uh, and working with someone to build something. That's a real business that I run, and I prefer that. I feel it's more, um, it's, it's just a challenging probably, but it's personally, for me, it's more fulfilling because I feel like I've created something that is mine rather than just on selling someone else's product, for instance. So it's each to their own. And what's wrong with drop sh shipping? Nothing. Plenty of people make a load of money off it. But if you want to go be a millionaire, well, the people who are millionaires are the ones who are teaching the courses and they make themselves more of a millionaire by selling their courses. You tend to find 99% of people who are, uh, you know, following these kind of guys, they, they probably are not going to be a millionaire straight away, but it's a good way of getting started. You know, it's not much, but if you want to go make, I don't know, 20 grand uh, in a month or so, then you could probably go do it from something like that if you really gave it action and consistency as well. So that's my view. Capital, I'd be interested in your opinion as well. Uh, Ivan Pashoff has asked, what is the webcam you're using? I actually use this, this is the way, I'm te just today I'm using uh, my mobile, which is actually the front camera on a Samsung uh, smartphone. I actually have a Logitech uh, HD webcam though. Uh, it's the top of the line one with like a glass front and all that kind of stuff. It's very good uh, quality, but ultimately it doesn't really matter so much. I think, I think it's as long as you can get um, 720 or 1080p uh, in terms of resolution and have decent lighting around you, then get on with the content. That's what really matters. Marketing, distribution and content are far more important than the quality of the video. Uh, but still uh, respecting your question and thanks very much for asking it. I think it's worth having one that's half decent. If you have quality uh, of video that's really poor, it will turn people off a bit. Quality of audio that's really poor, people will think you're a bit of a joke. So just bear that in mind, okay? Because uh, you can't be here, heard properly. Venu Morgan, who is a uh, regular on this show, thank you so much for joining me, sir, on episode 50, has asked, what's the difference between sales and marketing? And what should one learn first, especially in the online space? My God, that's a divisive question you've asked, uh, uh, Venu, because of course people are liking sales and liking marketing. Many face each other and like, oh, I don't know, mine's more important than the others. You could argue it's a chicken and egg thing. And it's interesting because when I first had, I spoke of that, that job I first had uh, 15, 16 years ago, and I was a sales guy, we didn't really have much of a marketing team to speak of and we didn't, the irony was we were running an internet marketing business, but of course <laughs> marketing was by the by because we were focused on just making money. That's all that mattered. I would say 98% of that business was salespeople. And then there were like a couple of people just trying to process orders. It was proper boiler room stuff. And, and perversely, I'm quite glad I went through it because I learned a lot of sales stuff, uh, I think, and also learned what I wouldn't do today, <laughs> you know. Um, what's the difference between sales and marketing? Sales is the process of, of actually uh, bringing purse I mean, in a nutshell, you could say that sales is the, is the process of, of um, delivering, um, I suppose, benefits of a product to someone to the point where you're closing them and you're, you're actually making a transaction. Whereas marketing is making people aware of what it is you're doing. Okay, so creating awareness and perception and things like that. So, uh, but sales is about the, the transaction itself, simply put. Which should one learn first, especially in the online space? If I had to, they're not distinct in many ways, there's a, is it, there's a bit of a crossover. We, I think we'd all agree it's a bit of a gray area between the two. Sales can merge into marketing and, and vice versa. But without marketing, there are no sales isn't exactly true because you can get sales without marketing. Okay, it's harder, but you can. Without sales though, marketing is kind of pointless because ultimately, I know great marketing can then close stuff, of course it can, but if you had to pick the raw extremes of sales or marketing, it'd be sales every single time for me, every time. And the reason why is because I know from experience, I've had it in the past where it's like, years ago it was like, right, 
we haven't got enough money unless I make three grand this week. I need to get on the phone or I need to knock on doors or I need to sell people through chat online and I need to make 3,000 quid this year. No, sorry, this week. That has to happen this week. It's Monday. Let's go do it. And having sales ability means that I never was like, oh, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I don't know if it's going to work. If I put out these ads, maybe it might turn into something, might get some leads. No, I can prospect. I can go out and say, these are all cold people. I'm going to build sales from that and I could go make money and so with sales what it means is that whatever happens to you whatever also happens to the economy okay you can always say I've always got sales to fall back on and then what that means is when I'm when my back's to the wall and if I'm really pressed I can go make more money I can just do it if I have to I can draw money um out of the ATM of the internet, for instance, or, or the ATM of a phone by spending time connecting with people because I can sell to them, okay? And I can work with them, consult, and then get, get, an, get a, a, some kind of th thing put together. It's simple as that. And um, with marketing, uh, you know, I could, I could say, well, if I was very, very strong at marketing, I could, of course, generate great leads. And I think you've got to do the two, but it's essential uh, in 2017, this is probably the answer I think I should give, in 2017 it's essential to be learning both simultaneously. Um, it's wrong to um, expect great marketing to get you there. Great marketing involves great copy, okay, and great copy is in the text and what way it's written and language and so on. It it leverages sales because it's written in a certain way that gets people keen on what you are, are, are offering. You need both because at the very start, you need to create awareness and visibility and perception because that's your biggest problem. No one knows about you. That knocks into generating warm leads, which of course then you can sell to. And then you move to a very fortunate position I am in right now, for instance, when uh, potential clients come to me and then of course they are warmed up because they've seen maybe the Q&A, but they've also seen other things. They've bought little products here and there and ultimately, um, you know, they are much easier to sell to. But at the very start, you've got to be able to go get money uh, by selling directly without having to market. And, and because your marketing takes sometimes a bit of time to get moving, uh, even if you've written the great, the greatest marketing post in the world to cold traffic, because no one's ever heard of you, it's not always so easy to get results straight away. And that's why some people with internet, um, uh, with Facebook mar uh, adverts, for instance, they get paid millions because they're very, very uh, uh, capable of, get, of getting, uh, you know, cold sales or, or rather sales from cold, cold leads. So hopefully that helps uh, Venu. Um, so next question. Uh, basis, oh, Venu, thanks so much as well. The basics of sales course is incredible. I think it is. Yes. Great starting course. Why can't one create a value in affiliate marketing? I think you, I think you can create value, but the problem is that a lot of people focus on just trying to get the commission uh, in affiliate marketing what you're doing is you're taking links to products that are made by others and you're trying to you know obviously get people to buy through your links so you get paid a commission on on the sale there's nothing wrong with it you can create value by say by focusing on a particular product set and generating um, uh, awareness around that product area being really very powerful and look, a lot of people do it with the uh, I'm going to be careful here. They do it with the whole, um, you know, alkaline water thing, Kangen and en energetic and all that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I won't talk about the science because the science, the, if you speak to doctors, or, like genuine doctors rather than just one guy who's written something, if you speak to, if you look at the actual science, I'm not going to tell you what, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, go look at the actual science first. You just make your own mind up. But let's, let's move to answering the question. The, the que I don't want to rant. There's no point. Because the people, it's like a religion. The people who are bought into it, they think it's right and it's real and it works. You, there's no turning some people because they're so bought into it. So fine, no problem. You indoctrinated yourself. If, <laughs> you know, if you feel that you're creating value through how, you know, posting about putting out content and documenting how positive lifestyles can help people uh, and you talk about great things and then you add in affiliates uh, uh, affiliate links to you know 
alkaline water or whatever, uh, then you can be creating value. Absolutely. I think it is very possible. So, um, but, but what I personally believe is that if you go after building a business when you build it on something that you've created yourself, there's just that much more interest on your part uh, on the success of the business. It just has to be because otherwise, you know, because it's built on something you've created, it's your own baby. So there is that worth bearing in mind. Uh, Michael Chittio, thanks very much for uh, uh, joining us. Hey Richard, how are you bro? You're bro? I'm well, thank you, love your work and website. Thank you very much, I'm putting my site, ran into a problem, I was wondering who built a site for you. I'm trying to upload my 58 video, uh, see more, uh, video course via WordPress. I want it to be visible, paying customers, would you know how to go back? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, PM me, uh, Michael, and then I'll speak to you about that. Zach, this, so the eight step startup course does not have an affiliate program. No, it doesn't. The eight step startup course does not have an affiliate uh, program at the moment. Uh, I don't think I will have one. Um, it's, uh, it's $57. So what are you going to get? Like $5 commission or something. There's little point in it. Um, the, the eight step startup course is uh, completely automated in the sense that there are ads that go on Facebook and, and people who kind of get into orbit around me and see the stuff I do. They see the course, they can buy it online, they can access it online and they receive an email with a login and all these updates and things like that. So there's no reason why uh, uh, I, I feel, well, there's, there's no reason why I need to actually actively be involved in, in, in promoting it because I'm using Facebook ads for it. But in terms of affiliates, no, there's no affiliate program where you get a, a pixel or a, or a Facebook link, uh, or sort of rather a link to it, uh, a URL that you are using to, to sell it. So um, I might do in the future, it's possible that I will with uh, the basics of sales course because that's three, four, seven dollars. So there's a little bit more chance of a decent commission for you, but that's that's not the way I'm going at the moment. I, I, I'd never say never. It's just not on the horizon right now for for uh, to be honest for that course. Uh, Michael, thanks very much. So let's answer a couple more questions, then we'll finish up. Uh, so the one here on my way to work, I was listening to Extreme Ownership. One chapter was about choosing the right size of the group you're leading. One person. Uh, Oak could only lead a group of four to six people. If the number of group members is more than six, the leader should divide the group and choose several sub leaders who lead their own small teams. Do you agree with this military group building? What's your experience in business that worked best for you? That's a really good question. And if you haven't read Extreme Ownership, there's over here Jocko Willink and Life. Is it Life? Yeah, Life Babin. They are US Navy SEALs. Uh, and they were like the leaders and the instructors. The guys are decent at being the US Navy SEAL. And as a result of being so successful in, um, you know, Baghdad and so on, they then um, uh, went out, they go out now and they, they, they've done TED Talks, uh, but they also go in corporate, go into corporate uh, world and they focus on leadership. And the, the whole idea of extreme ownership, which I strongly sub subscribe to and you should too, is this idea that everything in your world is down to you. It is your fault if things don't work. Even things that might seem out of your control, you still should take ownership for it. The blame game, as it's known, is something to completely avoid at all costs. If stuff and the one of the stories at the start of it was um, where they went into battle and someone got killed. Okay, one of their own troops got killed. And so, of course, they had to have a, uh, you know, they had to have a debrief in, in, in front of the top military commanders and work out what had gone wrong, where the problem was and where the blame lied. And they had all of the group in the room, uh, we, including people who were injured and wounded and that. And he had to stand at the front. And instead of saying, so, so you know, we think the problem was this. It was because this guy didn't do this bit right. And we didn't, we made a mistake here and the communication was bad there. Instead, he said, it was all my fault because I was in charge of the whole thing. As if I was the commander, then I should have made sure that communication between that guy and that guy was done properly. I should have made sure that that guy there knew to be in position at this time. I should have made sure that this and that happened as well. Even though other people were responsible for their own roles, he ultimately was the head. And when I moved to that space in business, I really did so much better because I recognized that you can't let people 
uh, just turn up at a business and expect them just to do everything and win. You've got to be with them. It doesn't mean micromanage them to the point where they're not able to, to be creative, but it does mean saying to yourself, if I have a task and an objective and it's my team or business, well, then it, it's my fault if it doesn't work. And even if it's someone else that you gave authority to look after something, it's still your fault because it's your business and your team. So you need to be equipping them with everything you possibly can to make sure they're able to do it. And I think um, Gary Vaynerchuk recently said um, about his company, VaynerMedia, it was a really good example. He said something like, um, as the CEO, I'm not the big boss, I'm the bitch. He said, I'm, I am their bitch. So basically, whatever they need, I'm there to make sure they get it. It's the most important thing. And I, I, I firmly agree with that. So I look at all my businesses now and it's like, if that one's not working, it's my fault. What about if the Facebook ads run by a guy who's doing Facebook ads for me isn't working? Well, it's my fault because I'm employing a guy who's not up to scratch or I'm not giving him the information he needs. Maybe I should invest in him. Maybe I should pay for him to go on a course. Maybe I could, whatever, you know, it's all down to me. But in terms of this question, in terms of teams, the best of the experience I've ever had uh, with building teams is when I was building a um, uh, executive search team in London many years ago and we worked uh, we were scaling very very quickly from literally zero there were four of us directors and we said you know we have to make like something like 20 grand a month each to keep the light songs the rent was expensive in that part of London as well and we had a bunch of desks with no one sitting on them and it was a case of saying we have to recruit people we have to get them in we have to move up quick so we had a rule of one and three and the idea was you have one manager and three people underneath Okay, so there's one manager sat at the top and he was transactional. So I was closing deals every day. I wasn't just sitting back and doing admin. So I was leading by example, making sure I was making money. Then I had three guys underneath me. Okay, now those three guys, I, might, I was directly responsible for making sure did a great job. And as they grew, if I wanted to bring a new person in, I wouldn't have a fourth person. So I have these three guys I wouldn't add a fourth on that level. He had to work or she had to work for one of these three. So they became sub managers. And then it was just a pyramid. That was all it was. Um, so basically I had me at the top and three people. And each of those three ultimately would become managers of three more. So then I'd have nine underneath. Ultimately, they all are my responsibility. But whilst I chat to them and things like that, the reporting line went through only those three. It meant I could get on with my work. It meant I could be transactional. I could be out doing uh, meetings. I could go and close stuff. But it also meant that the three people reported to me, they, um, they reported on behalf of the three underneath each of them. And the three underneath each of them became managers and had that and so on. And some, some of those p columns were bigger than others. But ultimately, only three people had to report to me. And the guy who's five generations down, it didn't really matter so much how that was going on because they, you know, the manager above there and the manager above there were looking after it, but ultimately I needed to just to know the, the top line numbers. And it was very effective, very effective. And we did that across multiple industries in that company. So each of us heads had three people, then had three people, and then had three people. When you go more than that, it, you can do it. I mean, I've run a team of eight to ten um, before I then had sub managers underneath them. Um, so, so that's eight to ten reporting all into me and then sub managers underneath. And I, I found it started getting a little bit messy because I was trying to do uh, I need, I wanted to also do other things as well. And I found that if you just draw functions together, you can have a guy sitting atop it. So rather than having a load of sales team reporting to you, have the sales have a sales manager who reports to you. Become you know a, a division head and put the sales manager underneath. Then he looks after six sales team. And then you have a guy who looks after staff in general, or one who looks after finance. It's easier. And as you grow and get bigger, you might need to then have someone slotted in between who looks after a number of functions. So operational side, for instance, and one being a back office or whatever it might be. Um, but I think the rule of one and three worked so well for me. So I'd strongly suggest that um, and uh, yeah so that that's uh, that's important stuff um, I'm gonna finish with one more question uh, which here is uh, how can I stop needing to feel good to do good work like there are some things I love because I know it makes me feel good so live videos coaching designing engagements and chatting to fit to, to people Okay, so, so the question is, how can I stop needing to feel good to do good work? And anyone knows me, knows that I'm big on this thing of, of um, 
you know, you shouldn't have to be motivated in order to take some action and do something. Taking action and getting on with your work should happen anyway. If you don't like it and you don't feel happy, you should be doing it anyway because your business requires it. Do you really think the, 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 the accounting stuff I'm going to do later on today? Some people might love it, but I'm not really that fussed with it. But I still have to do it. And I can't wait until I'm motivated to do it because it needs doing. And it's that direct parallel with having children. It's exactly the same. When you've got a newborn baby, no one wants to get up at four in the morning. I don't like it. I don't feel good about it, but I have to because the baby needs her milk. So it's important to make sure I do it the right way round. And, and if I always if my business always has to wait for me to be motivated and in a good place mentally before I do any work, it's a huge error because every time I'm not feeling in that, that kind of space, the business has to pause. It's like the baby going without. It's ridiculous. So you're putting your personal emotional needs ahead of the needs of the business, which isn't the right way of doing it. It's like having a baby and putting your needs ahead of the baby's. The baby needs stimulation and you're on your phone. That's not right. You shouldn't put your emotional needs in front of the baby's. Phone away, baby needs stimulation, look after the baby. When the baby's sleeping, get on your phone, good for you. Same with the business. When the business needs in income, for instance, you've got to drop what you're doing. You can't watch Game of Thrones. You need to go make some sales. It's more important. So you treat it like, you're like one of your own children. You, you can't go far wrong. And the question here uh, is, is how can I stop needing feel good to, to, go to, to do good work? Because look, I haven't, I haven't answered that. That's not the solution, but that's what you should be doing. Sometimes, let's be honest, we are humans. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you do need to actually recognize that you're feeling rubbish and you just need to have a lie in because you've just been nonstop for days and you're having a bit of a tough time and you just need a bit of a breather. But probably it's because you're wallowing a bit. And <clears throat> what I would suggest is if you're having a rubbish time and, uh, you're not enjoying some of the tasks you've got. You need to heavily punctuate your day with good stuff. So if I have five tasks to do that I don't enjoy, I would do either side of each of those tasks. I would be doing the fun stuff I enjoy doing. And that would create some momentum because I'm taking action. I'm doing this. I've done that now. Great. I feel really good about this. Now I'm going to do this. Before I even think, I'm moving on to the next thing. Now I'll just do this accounting thing. I've got to send out that invoice and that email. Now I can get on and do this fun and creative thing I wanted to do. So it's a case of sandwiching. Don't just have a day where you do admin because you're going to be bored by it. Make sure you're doing fun stuff in between as well. So keep chopping and changing. Variety will help, um, but I do think that that, that, that tends to work. Um, and sometimes it's difficult because you do need to feel good to do some good work. You know, you, sometimes being creative um, is better when you're in a good place. But what you've got to do is batch the tasks. So the tasks before that that you're going to do, you've got to say, well, well, how am I going to get myself in a good place? I need to write an article. For instance, I today am going to be writing an article. What do I need to do? I need to make sure I have a, a good thing happen before because that will give me that momentum. If I have a crap thing happen before, I'm not going to feel good about or creative about writing that article. So before that, I'm going to have a phone call with someone and I can catch up with a client. I know it's going to go well. Uh, Maybe there's a sale that closes and then I know I can write this article and feel really good about it. So you can set yourself up to do it that way, I suppose. Um, that's one thing I would suggest. Uh, but, but ultimately, the thing you'll bear in mind is that if you stop and you think about how you feel, you will now move to a place where you start throwing fear in, you'll start feeling demotivated because you're allowing emotion, the limbic brain, you're allowing that motion to kind of pick up uh, and, and play out and see how things could all go wrong and it will start talking you out of doing stuff. What's important is instead of doing that, you should be taking action all the time. When you take action and you do, you don't give your brain enough time to think. When you don't give enough, your brain enough time to think, you, you don't have enough time to get emotional and to fear stuff or to feel bad. You're just doing. And that's the way to look at it. It's, about, it's almost like you're distracting your emotional self by getting stuff done. So work a bit faster, work a bit harder, get a bit more intensity behind action, okay? And that you tend to find that helps a lot more. But that's my suggestion here is do things that are fun next to the stuff that's maybe not so fun and you, it will help level you up. Um, some things will make you feel good. So that's just that. And what you gotta do is leverage that and do the stuff you don't like maybe quite as much. But hopefully that helps. Look, 
I've really enjoyed that. I could go on all night and there's loads of questions coming in as well. Thank you so much for joining in. It's been 50 weeks. Uh, I can't believe I managed to write that. It looks half legible back to front because obviously it's the mirror image uh, on Facebook Live on the camera. Um, it's been really good fun and I'm really looking forward to the next uh, 50 episodes as well. In two weeks time it is the year so I'm looking forward to another bit of a celebration there. Everyone who's joined in you're all amazing thank you so much. If you liked the episode uh, do like it do share it as well. If you have any other questions just pop just pop them in. I think there's been like 25 uh, uh, comments and questions in there already but thank you so much. I genuinely genuinely wouldn't have made it without you guys. You're very supportive uh, and it's amazing to every week be able to kick off a Monday uh, with this session because we have this interaction. It's nice to get questions from you and it's just, as I said before, it's so flattering to have people decide every week to join in. I get some people say, it's the thing I do in the morning is tune into your Q&A and that means a lot to me. It means we're giving great value. And like I say, it's, I've worked out it's about 400 questions. So it's insane the amount of stuff we've done. So thank you very much. Great things are ahead. Have a massive week. Go get it. And remember, consistency in action. And you end up uh, producing something that's been around for a while. Here's to uh, the next 50. Then I'll catch up with you soon. And have a great day. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.